Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English. Learn to speak English like a native. Speak English powerfully. Speak English effortlessly. Think in English. Train with me. Commit to my VIP program. Join now at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go today and join at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. VIP members, those who are already members now, add my pronunciation course. It's a good combination, those two. Really, they work together. We'll um, speed up accelerate you know the word accelerate because means to go faster and faster will accelerate your improvement will accelerate especially your speaking ability when you add my pronunciation course to your VIP membership of course my pronunciation course the pronunciation course is also at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. I'm back yesterday. I spent the day <laughs> with a uh, with family, playing with uh, playing with some children. Actually, had a good time. Lots of fun. Always enjoy doing that. When I do that, you know, it's usually a long day because uh, I'll usually spend the whole day with them and they are very energetic, as all parents out there know, and they just never stop. <laughs> they just go, go, go from when they wake up until it's bedtime. And so there's not many breaks when I'm uh, hanging out with the kids. But today, right now, I am uh, I'm in uh, downtown Osaka. I'll, let's talk more about Osaka, just in case you wanted to visit Osaka or Japan. It's time for another <laughs> tourist recommendation, tourist description from your guide. That's me, AJ Hogue. <laughs> Anyway, Osaka, uh, yeah, like most big cities, right? Osaka's a big city. It's a large city, you know, so it's like, like Tokyo. Not as big as Tokyo, but it's still big. It's big, like San Francisco, New York, London, you know, big famous cities. So large cities, right, they're, because they're large, they usually have several different locations or areas, right? Not just one, because they're so large. So Osaka's similar, of course. There are some several interesting famous locations but um, the cool thing about Osaka is that the, the major business areas shopping areas restaurant areas they're really in the center so on, on the south side of Osaka in the center you've got Namba Namba station Namba, there is, is actually a Namba train station. And then, of course, the whole neighborhood around it is also called Namba. So that's Namba. And that's the big you know, hub, we say, H-U-B hub, right? It's kind of the central location of, because it's got the big train station, there's uh, several train lines. They all stop right at that spot. And one of the major ones starts and finishes at Namba Station. So the trains going south, they all they uh, go through Namba. 
So there are lots and lots of shops and restaurants and businesses and things. So it's really kind of the big area in the south of Osaka, in the center. Then in the north of Osaka, there's another one. And this is called Umeda. And Umeda is the big neighborhood area around Osaka Station. As you might guess, Osaka Station is also a major, even more major, train station. S Osaka Station and that area, that large Umeda area, lots and lots of trains come through there and stop there and start there. So Umeda. That's in the north central, right? Center of the city in the north. Now here's the cool part. <laughs> Between Namba in the south and Umeda in the north, there's one big main road called Midosuji. Midosuji. Now Midosuji is also probably the biggest, uh, the most bi meaning the busiest uh, subway line in the city. It's the red line if you visit. And it goes north to south, connects Namba to Umeda. It's also a great walk because in between Namba and Umeda, kind of through that central zone, there are several other nice uh, shopping and eating areas. If you start at Namba, you start walking north, there's something called Dotombori, Dotombori, which has, has now become kind of a tourist thing. But traditionally, it was uh, food and drink, kind of, and not expensive. Traditionally, that Dotombori area, it's kind of a walkway, a covered walkway. And traditionally, it is the place, basically the party place, the late night place in Osaka, where you go to get, you know, kind of reasonable, reasonably priced food and drink. Now, un unfortunately, I'd say unfortunately, it's become very touristy. It's it's probably like 80% tourists now. So I, I almost never go there because it, it has, uh, it's not really a local place anymore. Also, if you start at Namba and you go north, but instead of, so Dotombori is north, but kind of a little to the east. If you're going north from Namba, but you go a little to the west, then it's Shinsaibashi. 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 Shinsaibashi is, um, that's kind of a cool area. I like it, actually. It's one, it's, uh, maybe my favorite area in Osaka now. It's got a lot of little local shops, especially clo lots of clothes. There's a little area in that uh, called uh, America Mura. America Mura means American town. There's it's this one little area that has a lot of um, shops that sell clothes that are American style. But then all along Chinsaibashi, along this this kind of walk going north. Lots of little small shops. That's why I like it, because it's small local people. Not not just big chains, right? Not big international chains. It's little small things, little small shops selling clothes or cafes or, you know, ja little small Japanese restaurants, things like that. Kind of funky, you know, a little bit of artsy feeling. Um, I like it. Yeah, it's kind of a lot of interesting creative people there. You can walk around there. You can see some interesting fashions of people walking around. Uh, so Shinsaibashi is uh, a nice little area. I like it. So that's going north, but a little to the west. <laughs> going north a little to the east is Dotonburi, which I just described. And then if you go north right down the center, that's Midosuji. And Midosuji is really more the big international chains, kind of kind of the expensive shops, things like that, you know. Louis Vuitton, and you'll see a lot, you know, Gucci, you see that kind of stuff. Which for me is nothing special, because it's the same in every single city everywhere in the world. But I will say, uh, I don't like the shop so much on Mito's, uh, that Mitosuji Street, but um, the actual road is kind of nice. It has trees down the middle. Right now, especially, uh, it's very nice at night because they're doing something called uh, Festival of Lights here, and it's they're doing it November and December, 
and they've put all these really pretty colored lights in the trees and the bushes all along that road all the way from Namba going all in the south of the city up the road up Midosuji Road all the way to Umeda in the north of the city I walked the whole walk uh, when was it yesterday two days ago two days ago I I walked I went I actually took a I walked up to Omeda in the day, but then at night I walked back to Namba down the street at night and it was oh so pretty, really pretty. Remind reminded me actually of Christmas in America where uh, in some of the towns and cities they put up lots of Christmas lights. Of course, they're not celebrating Christmas here in Japan, but uh, it's still a nice I like the lights, very pretty. Also along this, you know, kind of in the middle, in the center again, there's something called Homachi. Homachi is uh, a little to the east of this, but it's like right in the middle, right between, right between Namba in the south and Umeda in the north, in the middle, something called Homachi. And again, it's, uh, it's lots of little local shops, little local restaurants, lots of little small local restaurants, mostly Japanese. Little coffee shops, things like that, and occasionally you find some little clothes shops and things. Uh, but again, local people and small. And then as for, you know, Omeda, like uh, Namba, but even more so, Omeda is just a huge area. <laughs> really big. It's the, the largest uh, business shopping area of Osaka. Just So it's got everything. It's got gigantic malls with international shops. And it also has a large number of local shops and restaurants. And it's just, it's huge. I don't really even know that area so much. For me, it's a little too big. Uh, I don't know the Omeda area very well. Like I know how to get there and I walk around a little, but it's just so large. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming for me trying to get around it. I've got a few spots I go to, but mostly I stay down in the south near Namba Station because it's closer to where I live and it's a little smaller, uh, so easier to manage. So if you visit Osaka, I do recommend, uh, especially check out Homachi, check out uh, Shinsaibashi, especially if you like shopping. You know, Osaka is really good for shopping and eating. There's not a lot to see in Osaka, like famous sites, because, uh, you know, I've mentioned before, the city was destroyed during the war. There's the main site to see is Osaka Castle, which is very cool. Go see it if you get a chance. But otherwise, it's not very pretty. There's not really anything famous to look at, but it does have lots of cool little shops and lots of great restaurants. Okay, moving on, moving on. Let's talk a little more about The Alchemist. We're going to finish The Alchemist this weekend. The big conclusion. The big conclusion of The Alchemist. I was just reviewing the ending of The Alchemist, this last part, and... Again, you know, we have to realize that this is a parable it's a symbolic story. Now, of course, most meaningful stories have symbolism in them. But this kind of story, the symbolism is uh, very, very big and obvious, okay? So, in this kind of story, uh, it's very clear and very obvious that um, things are symbols for other things, right? It's not just directly telling a story. It's we have to always look for the, the meaning behind what's happening. So we've already discussed, for example, the treasure in this story. Well, what's the meaning of the treasure? It's not really about going and getting some gold. It's not a story about a guy who has an adventure and he gets some gold. 
right? I mean, there, sometimes we have stories like that, right? In movies where it really is just an adventure. It's about some some guys or some people and they just uh, they have a big adventure and they go and they, they get a bunch of money at the end and that's in it doesn't really have a bigger a lot deeper meaning to it. Right? There's some stories where the symbolism is much lighter, much less. But in this kind of story, this kind of parable, uh, we know very clearly that Paulo Coelho is, he's not telling an adventure story, right? And he makes it so obvious because <laughs> all through the book, almost every page, he's giving us directly, very directly, um, messages, right? Spiritual messages, um, messages about meaning, messages about life, right? So it's very, 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 very direct. Some would say too direct. <laughs> I mean, I, that's maybe one of my small criticisms of Coelho's writing in general, is it's just a little too much for me. Uh, because for me, he kind of loses the story. It becomes his messages are so strong and so obvious, and he's he's trying so hard to push his messages that. Uh, I feel that the story, he kind of loses the story many times, this, that his storytelling is weak. Right? His descriptions, for example, of what's happening are very weak. They're very, very, very shallow. He doesn't give many details. Um, you know, with this kind of book, and especially with Coelho, Really, the story is just an excuse, <laughs> okay? The story is just an excuse for Coelho to tell us his messages about life. I don't know. I, I, I kind of, sometimes I, I, I go back and forth. It's a nice story. On the other hand, sometimes I just wish, you know, maybe just write a non-fiction book and just tell us directly, <laughs> right? But some prefer this style of parable where you kind of, you're telling a message or messages and then you kind of put it in a little simple story. So we have a conclusion coming up. Santiago and the, and the alchemist that he met, the alchemist is now helping him. They're going to go into the desert. And he's going to have really one, uh, kind of two, but really one truly big, dangerous challenge. One more where his life is at risk. And in this section, um, he basically has to do some magic, right? He has to conjure up. It's kind of like a magician, right? Alchemy. Alchemy. Magic. Now, the first time I read this part of the story... Well, not the first time. A couple of weeks ago when I read it again. <laughs> and I was... I, I kind of... I had to struggle with it a little bit. I mean, it was obvious what he's saying, but I really had to think about it because I thought, well, how, what am I going to teach about this in the book club? You know, what is... What is... What is the message here, really? That is useful for all of us. Because on the surface, it's... Uh, you know, he goes and he talks to the wind and he talks to the sky and he talks to the sun. And he kind of does this ma big, huge magic trick, basically. What's that about? Well, I think the key is that to, to perform this magic trick after there's this really, really, really long description that goes on and on and on about, you know, how he has to talk to the wind and talk to this and talk to that and da 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 But what it comes down to eventually is that he has to talk to or connect with, maybe is a better word, connect with God. To, to perform this magic trick, he has to make a connection with, kind of pray to, talk to God. And that's how it finally happens. That's how he's finally able to perform this, this trick, this magical trick.
What does this mean? This is this is his master work. See, when he finally accomplishes this, when he finally does this, really he has gotten his treasure now. This is his treasure. It's not, you know, the story continues and he does get some money at the end, but really this is the true treasure that he's been going towards, although he didn't realize it, right? But this is the true treasure. The true treasure is that he, he gains this deep, deep, deep wisdom through through this uh well this huge challenge to make he doesn't really know magic he doesn't know how to make this trick happen he's gonna die if he doesn't do it and so he has to what he has to finally uh he prays to the wind he prays to this uh, none of that works completely and finally he has to you know pray to god and connect with god and i think this is the message that in other words he has to find the highest wisdom the highest truth now, part of what makes this a little difficult is Coelho's weird um, alchemy language because in many different parts of the world uh, we have already traditions that describe what he's trying to talk about but I think using more clear words that people understand more so if, if instead of we list he talks about the master work the master work and you know talking to the wind and all this stuff but I think what he's really talking about is something that uh, Aldous Huxley described as unitive knowledge Unitive knowledge. That's a little bit difficult phrase. Let's talk about what it means. Knowledge is understanding, right? Unitive understanding. Unitive means to join as one, right? To become one with something. Okay, so what does this mean? Unitive knowledge. It means that you know something by becoming part of it, by joining it. It has the idea of direct experience instead not just book knowledge right when you have book knowledge it's not unitive knowledge you're not joining with you're not connecting with the knowledge you know for example again let's imagine you want to travel to India and you read a guidebook about India well now you have knowledge of India but it's not you you've have you have no real connection with India you've never been to India right you never entered into India and actually uh, experienced India directly so you have a kind of knowledge but it's not unitive knowledge right it's a separate knowledge it's a knowledge of separation that's what book knowledge is school knowledge it's all separate because you're 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 separated away from what you're trying to learn from what you're trying to know See what Aldous Huxley said, and I believe what Coelho is telling us, and what uh, many great philosophers and saints and others have told us, is that you, you never really know something unless you join with it and directly experience it. That the book knowledge, with book knowledge you really don't know. You kind of know some things, but you really don't know. You really don't understand, right? You really don't understand India unless you go there. And, and really, you don't understand India unless you go there and stay there for quite a long time. But if you just read a book about it, you really, you know, okay, you know more than you did before, but it's a very separate, shallow kind of knowledge. So unitive knowledge is the opposite. Unitive knowledge is the, uh, the idea that you're joining in or you're ex directly experiencing this thing that you're trying to know or understand. So Aldous Huxley talked about and wrote about the unitive knowledge of and then the universe, God, wisdom, the Tao, Allah, Brahman, whatever word you want to use, doesn't matter, Nirvana. So I think that is what the message of this whole long 
a little bit complicated uh, <laughs> uh, section about him doing this big long spell because th for the spell to finally work, the, the magic to finally work, he has to connect with God directly, right? Not, not just reading about it in an alchemy book. <laughs> He has to gain a direct connection, a direct experience. If you don't like the word God, if you're not religious, then you can just use the word the universe or wisdom or understanding. But he had to gain a deep understanding of, of, of you know, the cosmos, the universe, you know, life, the universe and everything of deep, deep, deep meaning of deep, deep, deep purpose. Now, as I said, in, Coelho, using the alchemy language, this is described as finishing the master work, right? Their master work, that's what it's about. It's not really about making gold. It's about gaining this understanding. Now, we have better words for, the ma better words for this, more common words. The more common words for this would be salvation or awakening or enlightenment. Now, these are the words that have been used for thousands of years by different philosophers and saints to describe the same process. Right? When, when you gain the unitive knowledge, right? You connect with and then therefore truly understand the universe, the Tao, God, etc. Then you are enlightened, enlightened. Then you are awakened, right? You wake up to true reality. You're enlightened I mean, it means you're filled with light. Or you're saved, salvation. You achieve salvation. Saved from what? Saved from suffering. Saved from ignorance. Saved from evil. Saved from pain. That is the true treasure. That is the real treasure that Santiago has been looking for. And that is the true treasure that he finds, that he achieves, that he attains and gets. He gets it before he gets the gold. And what's interesting is after he does this, after he achieves and attains this, this great understanding, this true treasure, then after that, I mean, the story keeps going and he goes to the pyramids, right? And he keeps going and we'll talk more about this Saturday or Sunday. But you can kind of feel, at least I do, uh, from that point on that like the gold part just doesn't seem all that important anymore, right? It's like he has become who he needed to become. He has, he has found that great, that greatest wisdom, the greatest purpose, the greatest understanding. He's, com he's transformed, he's changed into a completely different person. And now that he has attained that great wisdom, that awakening, the enlightenment, the salvation, eh, the gold, I mean, it's, he keeps going, right? He, he, go, he goes, he keeps going, but it, you can tell he doesn't seem to even care that much about it. We'll talk again this weekend more about it because when he finally gets to the pyramids, we, you see like, you know, he starts looking for the gold and then he starts having problems and he's like, huh? He, he, ha he has equanimity at that point. He has a great equanimity about the gold. You know, he's, he's still trying to get it because he's trying to fulfill his dream that he had. But you can also feel that he knows that he has already achieved the, the true treasure. And so, well, he's, you know, he's, he's going to be okay. He's going to be happy. He's going to have this wisdom no matter what happens. Whether the gold, he gets the gold or he doesn't get the gold. Even whether he lives or dies. He seems like he has found this great peace inside of himself. Now, as we look at this, I think there is a very nice message that Coelho is giving us here. If we look at the whole story now, now that we're getting to the end, and we go back and we kind of consider, think about the whole thing, we can kind of see that one of the messages he's giving us, perhaps the main message he's giving us, is that lesser 
goals, smaller goals, smaller dreams can, can, not always, but can lead us to greater and greater and greater missions and eventually can lead us to the highest purpose, the highest meaning of all. Santiago, he starts in Spain. He has a dream of treasure, literally treasure, right? Meaning actual gold in a box, <laughs> right? He has a dream about it. And he, ah, oh, do you know, do I follow it? Do I follow this dream? But you know, if, when we think about it, well, that's kind of a small goal. It's not very deep, right? He, when he's in Spain at the beginning, he's not thinking about uh, and wisdom. He's not, he, he knows nothing about alchemy at all. He's not thinking about deep meaning, philosophy, God. He's not thinking about any of that stuff. He's just walking with his sheep. He has a dream about gold at the pyramids, right? Money. <laughs> But it's such a powerful dream that he feels like, well, there's maybe there's some message in this because it seems really powerful. And of course, it's attractive to him. Oh, oh, get rich. Find a bunch of gold. So in some ways, it's a little bit of a shallow goal or dream. But because he follows it, it leads him deeper and deeper, right? Because we see that the journey itself just trying to get to the gold, the money. <laughs> because he keeps thinking about it, because he keeps facing challenges and difficulties, because he keeps learning and growing, learning and growing, be, trying to get this gold, it, that this gold, this, this kind of uh, basic, greedy dream, really, in a way, <laughs> it leads him to wisdom. And I think that is a message that he, Coelho, is trying to tell us that um, when we really think about it, you know, these things that give us great enthusiasm, these, these, these intuitive dreams that come to us again and again that seem extra powerful, that seem to carry or have some kind of deep emotion or something in them, and sometimes we, we're not sure why. <laughs> Right? We just feel like, I, I need to start a business. And I don't know, you know, you're not thinking about, you know, God or truth or wisdom or any of that. You're just, you know, maybe you just think, I'm sick of my job, I need to do this. But if you keep thinking deeply and you keep asking these questions, you keep going, you keep learning, especially that. You keep learning and especially you keep going deeper. You keep thinking more deeply, asking deeper and deeper questions, constantly looking for deeper and deeper meaning and purpose, right? You never stop looking for deeper meaning, deeper purpose, deeper meaning, deeper purpose, more wisdom, more learning, more wisdom, more learning. That step by step, these smaller goals or these worldly, we would say, worldly goals can actually lead us to the highest goal, the highest purpose. That's what happened with Santiago, right? He dreams of treasure, just gold, money. But he has to take a lot of uh, leaps of faith, right? He has to take a lot of risks. The first risk is selling the sheep, just believing the dream and go going to this strange land over to North Africa, to Morocco. Right, and then he's got his money stolen, right? And then he's got a lot of difficult problems happen. And then his next goal, again, it seems like a small goal, like a, just a normal goal is, uh, oh, I got to make money. I got to make money again. I need a job. So he gets the job at the tea shop, the crystal shop, but he keeps learning, right? He, he's challenged. He keeps learning. He keeps, and he keeps thinking about purpose. He keeps thinking about that dream and he keeps, you know, observing and trying to learn, not just learn how to make money, but learn about everything in life, become wiser. And so he helps, you know, he learns all those business skills and the tea shop and the crystals, but he also is learning about life in general. He's getting more wise. He's listening to his intuition and understanding his intuition more. 
He's looking deeper and deeper inside himself. And so when he finally gets all that money from the tea shop, he decides to keep going. This is a key message from Coelho too. You gotta keep going on this journey that you're having in life. You can't avoid the challenges. You can't turn back. If you turn back, you, you lose the treasure, the real treasure, which is this wisdom, this enlightenment, this awakening, this meaning. He keeps going, right? He then, and then as he keeps going, of course, then he starts gaining ever more wisdom. This is when he learns finally about alchemy. It's not till he's in the desert with the Englishman, and that's when he first hears about alchemy and starts learning about that. And this alchemy is going to be, you know, one way he learns more about wisdom. But then again, we get the same message from Coelho about the alchemists themselves, how the master alchemists, again, they started with this seemingly um, shallow goal, right? Not, not a spiritual goal. Their goal was, let's make some money. We're going to get lead. We'll get some metal and we're going to turn it into gold. Yes. <laughs> but again, with the alchemists, right? He gave us this message by showing us that the master alchemists, because they became so focused on that goal, they had to work so hard they had to have so much discipline, mental discipline, emotional discipline, that it led them to wisdom, that it led them to purify their minds and their hearts. It led them to the real treasure. Truth, meaning, beauty. Right? So you can think about this yourself. When I talk about purpose and meaning, uh, a lot of people get excited about it. I'll get a lot of great messages on social media about it. It's a popular topic. At the same time, I also will get comments from people asking. Very frequently I get comments, how do I find my purpose? I don't have a purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't, I, I, I don't feel any purpose at all. I don't feel any meaning in my life at all. Nothing deeper. I don't know what to do. These comments are especially common with younger people. I'd say, you know, people kind of, uh, especially like 18 to 28, let's say. <laughs> Late teens and uh, early 20s. It's a tough time in our modern world where a lot of people have to ask this question. But it's not only younger people. It's people of all ages who struggle with this question of purpose and meaning. And the most common question is, how do I find it? I don't have any feeling of purpose or mean, deeper meaning. So AJ, how do I find it? I mean, how do you find it? If you don't have it, where, where, where do you get it? Where does it come from? Right? And, and uh, how do you decide what to do with your life if you're feeling that? Well, Coelho is giving us a practical uh, advice and a, a, he's giving us practical advice. He's giving us a practical solution to this, which I think is a good one. We can learn from this, especially if you have this problem, this question. Remember, Santiago did not start. His goal was not salvation. His goal was not enlightenment. His goal was not to become a master alchemist. His goal was not um, to achieve the highest wisdom. His goal was not peace of mind. None of that. His goal was straight up money. <laughs> Gold, right? <laughs> but it was a dream. It was an inspired goal. So it came from deep, deep inside of him. And it, it, it wasn't, it was, a, it was a, a goal that was connected to, you know, learning and adventure and risk. Right? He, he wasn't dreaming of power and control and that kind of stuff. But still, you know, it was a really basic goal. It's just the, he was just enthusiastic. He had this strong dream. 
he, he was enthusiastic about it and he decided to, to, tr to go for it, to try it, to try to get it. And I think that's a good message. So basically you start where you are. You start where you are now. And if you're just lost, what should I do? Well, just look at your life, look at your emotions, your thoughts, and what are you enthusiastic about? What are you very enthusiastic about? What makes you feel very, very happy when you do it? And start there, start there. That's the direction you need to go. It might be something really small, right? It might not feel like it's some gigantic purpose. That's okay. Maybe you love, um, maybe you do love the idea of, of, of uh, business, doing business, having your own business, being free. You know, for me, it was travel. It was travel. That's what it started with way back when I was <laughs> uh, in my 20s. It was travel. Just, ah, I want to see the world. You know, I just had this deep, intuitive, enthusiastic uh, attraction that I, I got to see the world. I got I to gotta experience the world. It's not enough just to read. You know, I, I don't want to just read it. I want to see it. I want to I, I wanna see what India is like. I want to feel it. I want to taste the food. I want to be there. And then, you know, it expanded from India and to lots of different places. But I want to know this world that I'm living on. That's where it started for me, and that led me to much, much, much deeper things. It has continued to do so. And so now it's the same thing. You know, I've arrived, not quite at enlightenment, but um, I have arrived at certainly a deeper purpose where just traveling now is not, it's not my purpose, right? I needed that when I was young, though. I needed that goal to get me closer to something deeper. I still like traveling, but it's, uh, uh, you know, my goals and my focus and my purpose is much, much uh, deeper and more spiritual now. But if, it, if you don't have that, that, you start where you are. And it's okay to start with something. As long as it's not hurting other people, right? As long as it's not going to hurt you or other people. <laughs> And as long as you're going to gain, you know, you're going to be challenged, you're going to have to grow stronger and wiser by trying to do whatever it is you're thinking about, then do it. Move that direction and see what happens. Because what often happens is that one decision leads to another and then to another and then to another and you never really know where it's going to go. You might be surprised how far you go after you make that first step. You might be surprised at how deep and how big the goals and the missions and the purpose becomes starting from a first one that seems quite small in fact I'd say this is probably the most common um, mistake or frustration that people make when they start this, when they start asking this question, it's a great question to ask yourself, what's my purpose? What's, what's the purpose of my life? What, what, what are my deeper missions, the deeper purpose in my life? It's really great. That's fantastic. But then people become frustrated because okay, they, they can't think of anything. So then next they start thinking of, well, uh, what, what am I enthusiastic about? What do I really enjoy? But, and then the answer they get seems so small. Oh, I enjoy being outdoors. I enjoy traveling. Um, I enjoy computers. Whatever it is. That seems so small. Like, well, uh, it's not like knowing God or achieving enlightenment or something huge like that, right? <laughs> Leading my nation, <laughs> right? It just seems so small and little. And so sometimes people just like push that to the side. They think, well, that's little. That's that. Uh, that can't be. It's too small. It seems meaningless. No, 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 no. That's where you start. That's where you start. Don't try to force yourself to start with uh, a goal or a purpose or a mission that's bigger just because you think you should, okay? Don't try to force yourself to do that. Don't force it. This is not something that should be forced. It really should be something that you're pulled to, that you're attracted to, right? Santiago is attracted to, pulled to the pyramids. He doesn't have to force himself to do it. <laughs> 
and as he, he just keeps going deeper and deeper it's not like he's forcing himself to do that he's just natural just by continuing to try to learn and grow and following this mission it just seems like the meaning and the purpose get deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger it's a natural process so you have to trust that have faith in that so just start with something small that you really love and you're really enthusiastic about maybe you love drawing so you just start drawing and you focus on drawing Okay, it doesn't mean you have to be you don't have to become Michelangelo, okay? You don't have to become a professional artist. You don't even have to become a practicing artist. It's just the first step. You're enthusiastic about drawing, so do it. You never know where that might connect to. Maybe just because of drawing this causes you to meet somebody who's a uh, through that through that enjoyment of drawing you meet someone and that opens up another opportunity that goes in a different direction that you can never expect you know you, you don't try to plan out the whole journey all right I think that's the point with Coelho and in general don't try to plan out the whole path you have to be open to surprises okay let yourself be surprised you're going to be surprised by challenges and difficulties. That's okay. It's necessary, as we have discussed. You'll also be surprised by unexpected opportunities, uh, meeting unexpected, great, wonderful people, unexpected uh, new intuitions, new ideas, new innovations, new creativity. Let that happen. That's part of the journey. That's part of the adventure. That's part of what makes it fun is that surprise. You got to be open to that inspiration. When you try to plan the whole big thing from the beginning, when you try to choose some gigantic, super huge purpose that you're not really feeling, you're not really enthusiastic about, right? You're just doing it because you think that's what you're supposed to do. Then you, and then you try to plan it all out and try to plan out every step. You kill the magic. You kill the magic because you're trying to control it too much. A lot of the magic is in the surprises. So start where you are. The best question to ask is just, what am I really enthusiastic about right now? What am I enthusiastic about? And it doesn't matter how small it is. It can be tiny, okay? It doesn't have to be connected to a job or making money. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to seem creative. It doesn't have to seem meaningful. It certainly doesn't have to be spiritual in any way. Just be sure it doesn't hurt you or anyone else. That's all. Causes no harm. That's, that's the main rule. Other than that, just explore it. That's part of it too. And maybe you try that one thing you're enthusiastic about and uh, it leads somewhere. You learn a few things, you try it a little bit and then your enthusiasm kind of stops and then, but it leads, it connects to something else. I've talked about my nephew who does this, right? You know, he started with mushrooms, crazy, super enthusiastic about mushrooms, but then that led him to plants in general and that has led him to uh, insects and bugs and now currently he's focused on shells seashells seashells by the seashore <laughs> right each one each enthusiasm leads him to another so that's part of the process too. let it happen right Santiago he started with the treasure the enthusiasm enthusiasm for the treasure and then he ended up getting enthusiastic about tea and crystal just because he had to get that job and he ended up becoming quite enthusiastic and quite good at it he didn't expect that he never imagined that when he was in Spain he also didn't imagine alchemy and learning about alchemy or meeting an alchemist he didn't imagine any of that stuff it's fun to be surprised by these things. Our lives, modern lives, are too predictable anyway. We need a little more surprise. So choose something you're enthusiastic about. 
and just go for it. Learn about it, try it, and most importantly, do it. Do it. Even if you're bad at it, just do it. Just do it, do it, do it. As long as you're feeling enthusiastic about it and loving it, just do it and just see what happens. And who knows, you may end up like Santiago, finding a very big and deep purpose indeed. All right, we will finish this book up this weekend. Go ahead and finish reading it. If you haven't finished reading it, please do. I'm gonna go for a walk. Oh, you know, one more thing. I'm uh, so I've been talking to you here next to the canal. There's a canal, like an right, that's a artificial river. And one of the interesting things I should tell you also about Osaka, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the show. I was planning to tell you. Uh, one of the interesting things, on this canal there's a little walk, like a walking path on both sides. I've mentioned this before, I've been here before. Anyway, one of the interesting things here is that on this canal you will often see um, two guys two guys, two young, usually young men, um, and they'll be talking to each other and jumping around and acting really stupid and crazy. I've, I'm looking at two that are right now that are doing this, with this tall skinny guy and this kind of shorter, little bit fat guy. And so as a visitor, you might walk by and you'll go, well, what? what the heck? These guys are weird. What are they doing? Right? And then you'll walk for another minute or two and then you'll find like under a bridge two more guys and they'll be doing the same thing they'll be jumping around and screaming and acting weird and you're like what the hell is this what are, you just, are these people crazy is this what, what is going on here <laughs> what this is is a unique part of Japanese culture but especially Osaka culture these are comedians these are comedians. These are usually amateur comedians, right? They're not professionals yet. They want to be professional comedians. They want to become successful and famous, but they're not yet. That's why they're usually they're young, the ones you see. So what they're doing is they're practicing their little show. They're practicing their jokes. And this specifically is a kind of Japanese comedy, and again, especially famous in Osaka, these comedy teams where it's two guys. I've mentioned this before in, in other shows, these comedy teams. And usually these comedy teams have, there's this, there's kind of the foolish guy usually, right? One guy's the, the fool. And the other guy is what's called the straight man, right? He's the guy that is, he pretends to be the more serious like one, right? Or the smart one. And then the other guy is kind of the, the foolish one and the crazy one. There's different variations to this. But it's a very, uh, it's a very famous and a very common kind of comedy here in Osaka. And there's a lot, a lot of young men who want to become famous you know it's kind of like uh, in america maybe you might see a lot of like guys rapping right like black guys especially in some neighborhoods they'll be s practicing uh, outdoors or somewhere or sometimes you'll see like guys doing break dancing right different kinds of street dancing well here <laughs> you will often see these guys doing comedy and so they're practicing their comedy routine so right now like the two guys there's to my left I saw two guys practicing and then down to my right I can hear two people yelling and it sounds like it's just some crazy people if I was in San Francisco I would guess they were you know homeless and crazy or drug addicts <laughs> but because I'm in Osaka I'm guessing no probably not they're probably comedians then they're practicing their their show their performance right and it's hard to do because it's it's loud they have to act crazy so it's hard for them to do this in their apartments most people in the city here live in small apartments so if they do this all their neighbors will get mad if they're doing this indoors at their house if they're living with their parents their parents go, hey, be quiet you know so they have to come out here in public this area next to the river is nice because it's kind of open 
um, it's not too crowded so they can find a little spot under a bridge or next to a bridge and and practice their uh, comedy routines so if you come to Osaka if you see uh, well, you know two people jumping around and acting weird and yelling and stuff that's what it is all right <laughs> I'll see you again soon as always, join my VIP program, speak English powerfully, commit to my VIP program, train your English to think in English, to speak effortlessly, so the words come out automatically, speak English automatically, speak English fluently, speak English powerfully, join and commit to my VIP program. Join at EffortlessEnglishClub.com Join today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com And hey, add my pronunciation course also. That's a superpower combination. VIP plus pronunciation course. Get them both. Join today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com